Greetings students and welcome back to another video on complex variables. In this lesson we're going to learn how to compute improper integrals that come from Fourier analysis. And by improper integrals from Fourier analysis what I mean is integrals of the form the integral from negative infinity to infinity of f of x times sine ax dx and the integral from negative infinity to infinity of f of x times cosine ax dx where a is some positive real number. Now if a were negative you could still take out the negative sign from the sine and the cosine expressions such that the number multiplying x in the sine and cosine terms would always be positive thanks to these convenient identities. So although the integration technique and justification for that integration technique rely on a positive a, you can always still manage a negative a by taking out the negative sign using either of these identities. Now let's start by recalling the manner by which we integrated improper integrals in a previous video. The link's in the description. In that video the functions we were integrating were just rational expressions which didn't involve sine and cosine and also satisfied a number of other conditions. What we did there was replace the x by the complex variable z and then perform a contour integral over the closed contour c where c was a curve enclosing this semicircular area in the complex plane. Now this closed contour integral equals the contour integral over the semicircular arc c sub r plus the integral over the line segment on the real axis. Now the way we calculated our desired improper integral was to first compute these two contour integrals in terms of the radius capital R and then take the limit of both sides as capital R approached infinity and then finally isolate this integral over the line segment of the real axis to get our desired answer. Now the technique we're going to use to integrate Fourier integrals is quite similar to the technique we use to perform improper integrals of just rational functions. However, we can't use the exact same method where we replace the x in our improper integral by z. The reason for that is if you take either the sine or the cosine of x and replace that by the sine or cosine of a complex number z, then the moduli of the sine and cosine will depend directly on the exponential of a y, the imaginary part of z. In fact, you can actually derive these formulas for the moduli of cosine az and sine az. I'm not going to do that here, but this is what they look like. Now since the hyperbolic sign is just the exponential of ay minus the negative exponential over 2, this confirms that the sine and cosine of a complex number z depend directly on the exponential of ay. This is actually a problem when you're looking at this integral over the semicircular arc because as the radius capital R approaches infinity in this limit, y also approaches infinity and when y approaches infinity, the moduli of the sine and cosine of the complex number z now start getting prohibitively large because of their dependence on the exponential of ay. So instead of straight up just replacing the x by the z in our Fourier integrals, we actually replace the f of x by f of z, but then for the sine or cosine terms, we like to replace them by the exponential of i a z. This is because if you split the z into x plus i y, where x and y are real numbers, then if you take the magnitude of the exponential of i a z, you'll end up with the magnitude of the exponential of i a x times the magnitude of the exponential of negative a y. Now in this case, even as r approaches infinity, this modulus is going to remain finite on the integral over the semicircular arc. The reason is that this first factor, the exponential of i a x, just involves the sine and cosine of a real number, so its magnitude is going to be just 1. In addition, the second factor, the exponential of negative a y, will also not approach infinity as capital R approaches infinity when you're looking at the integral over the semicircular arc, because the semicircular arc is on the upper half plane where y is always going to be positive, so as capital R approaches infinity, y will become a progressively large positive number, and the exponential of a negative of a positive number will always approach zero as that positive number approaches infinity. It will remain finite. So it's almost as if when you take the exponential of i a z, which is just the combination of cosine a z and sine a z, the e to the a y in the modulus of the sine term cancels with the e to the a y in the modulus of the cosine term. So the modulus of the whole combination no longer involves the exponential of a y. Therefore, by combining the sine and cosine to form the exponential, we've effectively nullified the exponential of a y, which causes problems. Let's go over the technique of dealing with these improper Fourier integrals.
The first step is to replace the f of x in the integral by f of z. Once you do that, you'll need to ensure that f of z is a rational function or the ratio of two polynomials p and q. We would also need to ensure that p and q have real coefficients and no common factors, that the degree of q, the highest power of q, is greater than the degree of p, and finally that q of z has no real zeros but at least one zero above the real axis. The reason that it can't have real zeros is that if q did have real zeros and we were integrating it over the entire real line, then we might run into some issues with keeping our integral finite. So to avoid those issues, we impose this fourth condition. Step two is to replace the sine or cosine terms by the exponential of i a z as I just talked about and convert the real integral you're working with to a contour integral over a semicircular section C of radius capital R over the upper half of the complex plane. Now this semicircular section consists of a straight line from negative R to R as well as a semicircular arc that I'll again label C sub R. It should be easy to see that the integral over this entire closed curve C equals the sum of the integrals over the line segment from negative R to R and over the semicircular arc C sub R. And this would be our step three, breaking down the integral over this closed curve C into an integral over the line segment plus the integral over the semicircular arc. I'll call this equation one. Now step four would be to let capital R approach infinity. In that case, equation one now involves an improper integral instead of an integral over a simple line segment. If you use the residue theorem, you should be able to evaluate the left-hand side because it's a closed curve you're integrating over, and if you use Jordan's lemma, you should be able to cancel the semicircular arc integral on the right, and this would allow you to determine the improper integral of f of z times the exponential of i a z. Now the final step once you have this improper integral is to take its real part if your original goal was to find the cosine integral and to take the imaginary part if the original goal was to find the sine integral. This makes sense if you look at the Euler formula. If I take this exponential integral and use the Euler formula on the exponential, then it breaks down into a cosine integral and i times a sine integral. So if the integral on the left is a complex number, the real part of that complex number would be equal to the cosine integral, while the imaginary part of that complex number would equal the sine integral. And that's why step five is the way it is. For a cosine integral, you take the real part. For a sine integral, you take the imaginary part. Hopefully all those steps make sense, but it's one thing to write down and explain the steps and another thing to implement and apply those steps. So let's do that. Let's solve an example problem. The problem is relatively simple. We want to integrate cosine x over x squared plus alpha squared from negative infinity to infinity where alpha is some real number. Essentially the problem over here is to integrate the rational function f of x which is 1 over x squared plus alpha squared times the trigonometric function cosine x. Let's go through each of our steps. The first step is to make sure that our f of x satisfies these four conditions which it does. It's a rational function with real coefficients and no common factors between the numerator and denominator. The denominator has a degree of two while the numerator has a degree of zero and the denominator has no real zero. So all the conditions are satisfied. Step two, if we go back up again, is to replace the cosine by the exponential and put everything in terms of z with the integral being made into a contour integral over a semicircular region C with radius capital R. Step three would be to break up this contour integral into an integral over a line segment and an integral over a semicircular arc CR, using this diagram above as your reference for what C and CR mean. Step four is to take the limit as capital R approaches infinity. The integral over the line segment from negative R to R now becomes an improper integral. Now the contour integral on the left, which I'll label A, can be evaluated using the residue theorem, which I'm going to do on the side here. Now the residue theorem states that the integral of this function over a closed curve C equals the sum of the residues of the poles of that function that are contained in the curve C. So if we want to apply the residue theorem, our first task is to find the poles of this function. And that's pretty easy. Just set the denominator equal to zero and solve for Z. You'll get two solutions, I times alpha and negative I times alpha. Now the only pole that's contained in the curve C, which occupies the upper half plane is the solution i times alpha, so that's the only residue we want to find. 
The next thing we do is find the residue of the function we're integrating at this pole, i times alpha. That's relatively easy because this is a simple pole. We just multiply the function by z minus i alpha and then evaluate the result at z equals i times alpha. When you do this, you end up with e to the negative alpha over 2i alpha. So now if you plug in the residue and apply the residue theorem, you'll find that the integral of this function over the closed contour c is pi times e to the negative alpha over alpha. Let's go back to our original integral equation and write the value of this integral a that we just evaluated. All that we've got left now is this integral over the semicircular arc. I'm going to label this integral as b and also go to the side and evaluate it. The idea here is to use Jordan's lemma to say that as capital R approaches infinity, this integral approaches zero. But if you remember the previous video, then in order to apply Jordan's lemma, we need to make sure that three conditions hold. The first is that the function we're integrating is analytic everywhere beyond a certain distance from the origin, which it is. The function only has two poles at z equals plus or minus i times alpha. And if we go beyond those poles, the function is otherwise analytic. It's continuous and differentiable. The second condition is that we're integrating over a semicircular arc, which we are in this case. C sub r is a semicircular arc. The third condition is that the function we're integrating has an upper limit on its magnitude over the semicircular arc C sub r, and that this upper limit approaches zero as capital R approaches infinity. If all these conditions hold, then we can safely say that this whole integral b approaches zero as capital R approaches infinity, according to Jordan's lemma. Now the only thing stopping us from straight up applying Jordan's lemma is the upper limit condition. So we're going to have to find an upper limit on the magnitude of the function we're integrating. So we'll start by looking at the magnitude of the function. First, we'll split up the numerator and denominator magnitudes because we're allowed to do that. The magnitude of the product of complex numbers is the product of their magnitudes. And since we're integrating over a semicircular arc, we can write z using the polar representation of complex numbers as z equals capital R times the exponential of i theta. Where capital R is obviously fixed, it's the radius of the semicircular arc, which means that our complex number z on the semicircular arc pretty much only depends on theta. Now the magnitude of the exponential, if you evaluate it, is the exponential of negative r times sine theta. And this is from my previous video on Jordan's lemma, so I suggest you go back to it in case you want to find out how I made this jump. Now in addition, the magnitude of the denominator is this square root quantity if you actually substitute z in there and then carry out the algebra. Now to get the maximum possible value of the magnitude of our function, we need to find the highest possible value of the numerator, which is just 1 over the semicircular arc where theta varies from 0 to pi, and we also need to find the lowest possible value of the denominator. And the only way you can get that lowest possible value is if you let cosine of 2 theta equal its lower bound of negative 1. So after simplifying, we can therefore say that the upper limit, the maximum possible value of the magnitude of our function, is 1 over r squared minus alpha squared. It's easy to see that this maximum possible value approaches 0 as capital R approaches infinity because of the capital R squared in the denominator. So therefore, we can use Jordan's lemma to say that our integral over the semicircular arc approaches 0 as capital R approaches infinity. We can now go back and cross off this integral b, in which case we can see that the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the i z over z squared plus alpha squared is just pi times e to the negative alpha over alpha, and this should cover our step 4. The final step is to take the real part of this expression because our initial integral involved a cosine. And since the integral of this exponential is already a real number, we can conclude that the integral from negative infinity to infinity of cosine x over x squared plus alpha squared is pi times e to the negative alpha over alpha. Anyway, that should do it for this video. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.